Hickok 45 here, your internet shooting companion. Coming to you from the beautiful state of Tennessee, I'm here again to yak at you a little bit about whatever comes to my meager mind. Maybe something of interest, you never know. Might touch on something occasionally that you have uh, a slight amount of interest in. <laughs> uh, Tennessee, hot. Yeah, it's been pretty hot lately and that's just the way it is here in Tennessee. If it's June, maybe even May, then on up through September, it's it's pretty warm. Unless we get a little break, a little reprieve from the weather occasionally. It's been up in the 90s, upper 90s. And, and of course, if you've been to Tennessee, you know that it's very humid most of the summer. So as you see videos, any of them posted through the summer, uh, I'm liable to be soaking wet, you know, whatever. Just, uh, just part of it. I don't really worry about it. I don't go change clothes necessarily for a video. Uh, it, yeah, you know, we stay outside a lot. You know, I, I get out and you know, mess around the place here, and you know, so uh, I'm, I'm going to be sweaty. If it's 90 degrees or 95 degrees, I'm going to be sweaty. So unless I'm going out for dinner at a fine McDonald's restaurant or something I'm not going to change shirts uh, but anyway so it's uh, just one of those things it's hot in Tennessee you have to live with it and uh, and I do I'm not going to be locked in the house uh, because it's warm outside or humid outside uh, we uh, we get out and uh, always have basically just uh, once you're outside messing around you don't think so much about it I feel sorry for people that stay in the house all the time sure if you've been in the house for 90 percent of the day and it's 96 degrees outside and humid uh, when you open the door it, it hits you like a ton of bricks but if your orientation is outside then it's kind of just the opposite when i go in the house the air conditioner hits me like a ton of bricks if it's down too low or if it's even running so this is kind of the way i operate uh, so you'll see a lot of perspiration if uh, you tune in this summer or any of the past videos I guess so anyway what we're going to talk about got off on the weather there didn't I uh, we're going to talk about the uh, whole summer in Tennessee and uh, some guns we've been shooting lately oh, a little touch on just a couple things maybe a little bit about reloading and a little bit about maybe concealed carry and we'll just see what comes to my mind how's that so I'm out here in the reloading room, and I have a little bit more time to to yak. Not necessarily more topics, but uh, I'm going to yak at you, and uh, we'll just see where it goes. You know, speaking of uh, the hot weather and everything, isn't it interesting uh, how society has changed? You, uh, you folks that have a little age on you, a few years on you, would notice this more than, than others, perhaps. But the... Uh, the the times really have changed you know when i was a kid and many of you probably if you uh, drove through our neighborhoods we were all out in the street we were out in the, the woods wherever we could get uh playing games and building tree houses i can't tell you how many tree houses we built and how many trees we climbed and built a log cabin back on the farm and you know, uh, I have kind of a split uh, childhood. We were on a farm about half the time, and then we were uh, in a kind of a subdivision part of the time in uh, northern Kentucky. And so I have both experiences, and I much preferred the farm experience, but uh, as you can imagine. But, you know, people were outside. Kids were outside, uh, even adults, you know, front porches. You know, we have all these wonderful front porches on houses with swings and chairs sitting out there and in lots of places nobody uses them particularly in the south where it's warmer and it's kind of a shame it's nice to have air conditioning and everything and all these conveniences but it really did drive us inside didn't it you know you just uh, i mean how many people live in a neighborhood and have not even met your neighbors maybe not even know who lives right next door to you just rarely ever see them it uh, has just been an incredible change over the years. I mean, I could get in my car right now, go drive through five or six neighborhoods in Nashville. I might not see a kid, you know, 
go back to 1960, and almost every kid would be out there doing something. So it's not just the air conditioning, is it? It's the the TV, the video games, and you know, and everything that 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 are uh, magnets, you know, inside the house, the computers, uh, YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just so different. And on TV, as I tell my students, it's hard to, for them to realize that there was just nothing to really attract you in the house. In the, at least where I was in northern Kentucky, nobody had air conditioning in their houses, you know, in the 50s and even in the 60s. And so why would you be in the house? You had about three lame television stations, you know, and running during the day in the summer. What, what's on? Soap operas? or game show or something. So there was really nothing to pull you into the house. That's hard to believe, isn't it? There was just nothing there. Uh, we played in the basement some. It was cooler. We had a nice big full basement in the house where I lived in the development. And uh, But we were outside doing things, building tree houses, playing in a creek, you know, just, just messing around, riding our bikes, lived on our bikes. So just totally, totally different uh, experience. And that's one thing we battle as uh, as shooters. You know, there's so many many uh, youngsters growing up and who have grown up, you know, without much exposure to the outdoors. And, uh, you know, hopefully the interest in video games and things will offset that to some extent because that uh, engenders some interest in firearms. They see a lot of cool, realistic firearms there. But, uh, you know, it's a shame they don't get out in nature more often. It's good for us. Look what it did for me. Turned me into a genius right <laughs> oh well anyway uh i digress but uh speaking of of summer and everything you know it's interesting how how uh i mean for 30 years or so you know i'll, I'll go into gun shops in the summer you know, and they're like a morgue sometimes and i'm i'm always, it's always curious to me because i still can't get used to that because you know the summer is the time we think of recreation you know being on the lake or just doing outside activities i know i've been on an academic schedule much of my life not all of it but it uh so naturally it's a time when i slow down and have more time but you know the world kind of oriented to summer fun and getting out and doing things but shooting seems to slow down or at least interest in uh shooting interest in firearms uh you know i was in a gun shop just yesterday and they were talking about it you know it just really slows down come summertime uh, of course, a lot of shooters are have a orientation to you know hunting, and you know your key hunting seasons. You know start gearing up, I guess, in the fall, and you know, through the winter, and in the spring, and everything. And so things start happening. But but anyway, um, just the opposite as usual. Imagine that as I am on most things. The summer is when I I really look forward to uh, to shooting, get out and enjoy it. There's not going to be. Uh, six inches of snow and it's not going to be 20 degrees yeah it might be a little hot and and humid but i can bear that but anyway i'm just the opposite summer's the time i look forward to doing a lot more shooting and hand loading and just everything and it seems that the rest of the world uh, cranks down a little bit for some reason and speaking of shooting you know i've been uh, playing with that the 500 uh, smith and wesson magnum and uh pretty much exhausted <laughs> my experience i guess with that and returned it we you still have a couple of things that will show up that we've done with that i think that uh, on the channel uh, the gun really kind of grew on me i have to say the uh, longer i had it the uh, more reluctant i was to <laughs> give it back it's uh, quite interesting as i've said and it uh it can be pretty flexible we took delivery on some hollow point ammunition from magtech that was a little less painful to shoot and was almost fun to shoot because that gun is pretty heavy so if you got some lighter ammo it uh yeah it's not going to hurt you too badly i don't know how many people have a use for a 500 smith and wesson magnum other than just to play with but uh it it, it could be loaded to point where it would uh, not just destroy you and uh, be pretty effective. I got these Magtex came in uh, UPS, and uh, they were in fact ordered them from Lucky Gunner. Uh, I think it was the only 500 Smith and Wesson Magnum round they had, and so I just ordered a couple of boxes, like 
last Friday. So they got here Monday when we were kind of wrapping up uh, of this week with what we were doing with that gun or Tuesday. And they're, I think they're 275 green, and they're a serious hollow point with a full jacket bullet. The bullet, excuse me, the bullet is a hollow point, and it's uh, fully copper. It's a solid copper bullet. It's made of copper. Nothing but copper in a hollow point. So it's kind of an interesting uh, bullet. I don't know if it's a Barnes bullet or not. I know Barnes is uh, famous for their, their copper uh, bullets. And I don't mean copper jacketed. If you're not familiar with that, there are bullets out there that are actually solid copper. Now, it is a hollow point. It's not a, like an African hunting solid. And when people talk about solids for hunting, they're generally talking about a bullet like that made of copper or a bronze copper combination. I have some of those. I, I loaded for the 458 Winchester Magnum when I had it. And they're just a, just a regular bullet, solid bullet but solid copper and bronze, you know, designed to, to not mushroom or deform. So, uh, but these are just, just all copper. And they're fairly, uh, uh, I don't know about comfortable, but, but less painful to shoot. And anyway, the, the gun was kind of growing on me, I'll have to say. I don't know if I will have to add one to the arsenal at some point or not. I think if I do, it will be probably in that barrel length, you know, 8 inch. Because, you know, one of those shorter barrel ones is just going to be uh, painful. There's no way around it unless you loaded it down to something that is really not a 500 Magnum. That means, to my way of thinking, I don't know, Whew, really painful. Particularly if you're going to shoot it. Now, a lot of people buy things like that. They shoot it three times. It's kind of a novelty. You know, shoot it twice when their brother-in-law comes over for Thanksgiving and they have a big laugh or something. You know, if that's what it is, it's a little different. But... I don't like to have something I can't load up 100, 200 rounds and go out and shoot 50 of them. You know, it's just kind of the way I operate. So, uh, but anyway, that's an interesting gun, and it really uh, did kind of grow on me. 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum, quite a round. And speaking of uh, modifying loads and that sort of thing, or loading your ammunition, I was going to just say a couple things about reloading. And uh, one of those is that... Um, it, with a gun like that, you could you could make it more versatile and bearable by reloading. I'm a fan of heavy bullets, and I, I can see if I had one of those, I'd want to load up some really heavy bullets. Not necessarily at 3,000 feet per second, but I think it would be fun chunking uh, you know five, six, seven hundred grain bullets across the hillside, <laughs> like throwing baseballs. You know that that I'd, I'd do some things like that with it probably. And uh, reloading just uh, makes the, the shooting endeavor and the hobby more more enjoyable. If uh, you've never done reloading, uh, some of you might, I guess I've not talked about this, but if you uh, have contemplated getting into reloading to save some money, uh, think of it beyond that because you really don't save money because you end up shooting more. Well, and of course that's the goal maybe, to save some money so you can shoot more, but you really don't save any money. So if you're on a strict budget and you just want to be able to uh, shoot that 500 rounds a month for less money, uh, don't plan on that happening. You'll end up loading a lot more ammo and shooting more ammo, and you will spend at least whatever you've been spending probably. So what it does is it enables you to shoot more. But beyond that, it is uh, a hobby in its own right, and it's it's fun. Now, maybe you've read things about that. If you read Handloader magazine or any of the gun rags, you know, you'll you'll run across people making those statements. Well, it's actually true. I'm here to tell you live and in person that it, it is a it has been a rewarding hobby. And again, like so many things, I take for granted. I guess I've been doing it so long, but it's very relaxing. It's not a chore. It's not even a labor of love. Uh, you, you, if you've not handloaded, you might look at it that way, thinking, well. I can't imagine sitting there and pulling that crank, that handle over and over, loading those rounds. You know, that's got to be the most boring thing in the world. Uh, it's really not. There's something uh, therapeutic about it almost. This really is. Ask anybody that does it. Uh, assembling your own ammunition. You know, it's got to be like sewing is or something for, uh oh, I almost made a sexist statement. Almost said for a woman. Because I know a lot of you out there probably so as a hobby, so I'm sorry I almost offended you. But it, it, really, you know what I'm saying? It's uh, it, it 
it, there's something therapeutic about it in, in a lot of ways. Uh, loading, it is kind of brainless, but you got to stay focused. I mean, it's like shooting. There's no margin of error. You know, you have to do the right thing every time and have yourself programmed, your brain programmed. If anything at all acts differently or you see, catch yourself doing something a little bit differently, like going up twice before you index the, the turret or whatever it might be, you know, you, to where you catch yourself, you know. But uh, beyond that, it's just uh, it's just kind of fun loading those rounds and watching them drop and fill up the bin and knowing you're going to get to shoot them and, you know, kind of building up your supply of a certain caliber and all that. Now, some people get a big thrill out of modifying loads and trying a lot of different loads. That's one enjoyment I don't have as much interest in because, as I've said before, I get a load that works and stick with it, and I don't change. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, if you want to learn to shoot, I advise you do that. If you want to become a good shot, it's, uh, it's really the best way to go. I mean, you show me someone who's always changing his load and changing his bullet, you know, for the same caliber or whatever. Uh, and I'll show you someone's probably not a great shooter. Yeah, maybe a generalization, but it's generally true. Uh, but by the same token, so what? You know, you just enjoy doing it, enjoy the hobby, and you like seeing what different loads do. You know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but uh, but reloading is, is very rewarding. It takes a lot to get into it in terms of you need to do some research. I've answered a lot of people in messages. I can't be the reloading network. I, I can't be the reloading uh, channel. And uh, that's one reason you don't see more on that perhaps because it, it uh, oh, man, does it provoke questions. And I, I don't give out low data and that sort of thing. You, you really do need to study it and, and uh, kind of get into that on your own. Uh, I've given you the basics in some of my videos, and I'll talk about it from time to time, but uh, the main thing is just get some powder and load that works well for you and, and stick with it. Uh, I just recently, uh, I think I've been talking about it, how I was about out of 357 ammunition, and uh, I needed to, because I was out of some powder I'd bought a long time ago, this kind of a hybrid powder, and I wanted to get back to some regular powder, and I had to because I was running out of it, so I had to decide what to do with that. And I did go back to Unique. You know, Unique is a classic powder for 357. There's lots of powder that work, but I just decided I'd go go back to it. And so I have a kind of a light magnum load, and you know, for my uh, cast bullets in uh, Unique, and happy with it. But what I did, uh, what I was the main thing I was going to talk about in my reloading topic was how you don't have to fret over. I mean, you need to think in a uh, I guess precise mode. You you need to have a, a, an eye for detail. You, you can't make mistakes. You, you, uh, if you're a bull in a china shop, you might not want to get into reloading. You know, oh, that's true. However, you you still don't have to just fret over some of the little details. For example, on that load. Now there are people in working up their load for 357, uh, even with unique powder. They would have uh, probably loaded up about eight different loads and gone and chronographed each one, tested for accuracy and three or four different guns, and finally settled on one that that had the the lowest extreme spread, you know, in velocity, you know, and that seemed accurate or the most accurate. They'd have bench rested them and gone through all that, you know. <laughs> what did I do? Well, I know what uh you know, I, I look at the maximum load in the minimum with a certain powder and bullet weight and I'll just drop down below the the maximum I don't know five ten percent depending whatever and I'll load a couple oh I'll load five or ten go out and shoot them yeah feels pretty good yeah I like that's about what I used to shoot that's what I'm used to that, that's good that's hot enough not too hot and then I'll come back maybe load another 20 or 30 go out and shoot those you know, maybe maybe I'll shoot them in two different guns, but probably not. And uh, I won't bench rest anything. I'll just shoot at the steel plates and shoot at some animals over there, and you know, and see if it hits where I hold, if it hits where I want it to hit, and, uh, and I'm able to hit with it. Uh, if I'm able to make some good precise shots on some things, I'll say, okay, that was nailed. And that's what I did. I guess about a week ago, and I loaded up about a thousand of them. You know, so <laughs> and and I'll, you know and they're fine. 
So, you know, the main thing is you don't want to, uh, you know, mess around. I, I don't mean to sound cavalier about it. Uh, the thing that I am extremely careful about is double and triple checking that load data, you know, in the catalog. We're online. It's, it's online, too, usually, and make sure the weight bullet I'm using in the recommended loads for that powder with that bullet and everything, and I go from there. So I'm not making a mistake in any way, okay? And that's it. And I think I mentioned in one of my reloading videos, another thing I like to do, I like a powder where if you double charge and knock on wood, I've not done that before, but in my 30 years or whatever it's been of reloading, I, uh, 40 years almost, I guess. I, uh, I like powder that is a little bulkier. You can save a little money by getting powder that, say, you get the same powder out of, or same power out of, say, three grains of it. Uh, well, it'll go further, right? You got 7,000 grains in a pound, and yeah, you can do the math and you get more around. But yeah, powder is not that big an expense. So the bullet is the biggest expense, and the primer and the brass, if you, haven't retrieved it but uh uh because if you did make a mistake in fact with my uh, unique load here i'm using i double charged one just uh experimenting here and i didn't put a bullet on it you know i value my life more than that and just looked at it and uh, the case was way up there near the top full so i would obviously notice that i mean that would i would jump out in my head because i don't really see the powder very easily i have to really look to find a powder down in that case as i set the bullet on it but that powder would be right up there in my face if i were to double charge you know so and a lot of my loads are like that and some of them spill over with nine millimeter i couldn't even i can't even come close to double charging because it spills all over the place if i were to do that so that's one of your fears that and of course not getting any powder in there and then having a squib load where the bullet gets stuck in the barrel that's that's another danger for and a topic for another day but anyway, you need to fret over to a certain extent, but then uh, just get a, a, a load that you want and stick with it. Uh, if you're new to it, I, you probably should not load a thousand like I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still working on it. I'll, I'll probably put in another thousand here next week or two because I, I, I kind of do that and then I'll switch over back to nine millimeter or something because I need to load some nine too. But. Uh, if you're new to reloading, you might want to take a little more care with it and shoot it a little bit more, make sure you like it, and, and, and get the same with a bullet. Get a bullet you like, weight you like. And, and I, again, as I mentioned, I usually uh, try to get a bullet that I am going to use if I'm going to carry that caliber, you know, carry. So I like to practice with the same weight and power factor uh, as the ammo I'm using as carry ammo. Okay, I'm not practicing with hollow points, but same bullet, same bullet weight same uh, power factor I don't know what powder they put in the factory ammo I don't care but I, as long as it feels about the same the bullet uh, impacts you know same the same you know I'm, I'm, I'm good with that so that that should make sense I shouldn't have to explain to you why uh, I like to do that so anyway a little chat there about reloading and uh, I'll try to do that from time to time because I know a lot of you are just getting into it or you're you're thinking about it and maybe you're a little wary of it a little scared of it Hey, it's time for the gun action of the week now. So, last week's, as you might have guessed, some of you did, it was that big old honking Smith & Wesson 500 Magnum. Uh, some ways it was hard to mistake. <laughs> the big cylinder and the clunking of uh, that cylinder closing. So, that's what it was. I couldn't resist while I had it using it. Okay, if you really... Uh, Clued in here to the videos and stuff that's going on. It, it helps, doesn't it? Because I'm uh, sometimes prone to just pick a gun I have for a little while or one I have out been shooting. I mean, this is hard enough as it is. You need all the clues you can get. So uh, you guys that follow the channel, a lot of times you have the advantage there and, and deserve any advantage you, you get. Right? So let's see what uh, this week brings this gun this was a little uh, kind of an alternative gun a little bit different uh you've not seen me well you may have seen me shoot it actually but not much so let's manipulate it a little bit here first just make sure it's loaded All right okay okay i think it's loaded yeah now i'll make sure it's not loaded is what i'm trying to say 
Okay. Well, let's just shoot it here. We'll trigger timer two. This is a loud action. Yeah. Okay. So, see if you can figure out, uh, you know, which gun that is. And uh, maybe we'll have a prize for you on that one. How's that? I think I mentioned to you that uh, that John and I might show up at the Louisville Gun Day this weekend, as well as uh, the Friendship National Muzzleloading Shoot up there in Friendship, Indiana. So uh, we'll see if you uh, if you see us prowling around, uh, be sure and say hi. And uh, you know, one of my one of my I don't know about loves. But one of my interests are muzzle loaders and black powder and all that. You almost wouldn't know that, I guess, by looking at the videos and the channel. But I've always always had that uh, fondness for them, I guess you could say. I don't shoot them very often, but I always thoroughly enjoy it when I do get them out. Uh, there's just something special about them. I've always owned, since I've been into firearms almost, a muzzle loader or two. And a percussion revolver or two, and don't shoot them that often. But they're just uh, this something that uh, there's a romance associated with those things. And I know a lot of you probably have not discovered that, and maybe you just hate the things. But there really is something special. They are dirty. They're messy, and the, uh, one reason I don't shoot them more often is uh, it's kind of comparing apples to, to oranges in a way where I can just pull out a Glock here and go shoot it 20 times. I don't really have to clean it. I, I do, but I, I wouldn't have to. But to clean it just takes a couple of minutes. Whereas, you know, I, I tend not to get out a muzzle loader unless I'm going to shoot it. I kind of save up my interest in the obvious, for obvious reasons because if you're going to shoot it once, you might as well shoot it 30 times because it's the same messy cleaning job either way whether you've shot it one time or 50 times you have that same chore so for that reason i guess is why i don't shoot them as often because i'm always thinking okay now when will i when do i when am i really in the mood to shoot that gun all maybe all afternoon or for a couple of hours and get really dirty and all that kind of thing so so it's easier to put that that kind of uh, event off i guess but uh, they're just really special and that's what the uh, the friendship thing's about it's a muzzleloading championship. And of course, they have a lot of vendors up there and uh, that sort of thing. So any parts uh, that you're looking for, just, you know, there's a huge flea market in conjunction with it. And there's a primitive encampment. So in terms of knives, especially primitive knives and primitive gear, leather, all that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, the leather we put on the shooting table. Generally, when we do videos, we got up at Friendship uh, I don't know, a year or two ago. It's just, it's just a very interesting place if you live in the vicinity. It's in South uh, Eastern Indiana. Now, I think it's about 30 minutes from Cincinnati, something like that. But uh, quite an interesting event. And of course, a lot of people show up to actually shoot. Imagine that, you know, <laughs> they're, they're actually competing. I've never done that, and it's a huge range. Silhouettes and paper targets, just, just everything. So i uh, been going on for a long time. I don't know how many years. I think probably back into the 50s or 40s or something, maybe beyond that. I, I forget the history. So uh, but anyway, we'll talk about muzzleloading there. But if you haven't tried it, uh, it's it's if you like firearms, you can't not like it. It just might not be your favorite thing to do. But uh, if or if you're afraid of a mess, you've seen some of the videos I have. I have videos on the the, the flintlock and the infield cap lock. I have the old Civil War rifle and uh, a uh, percussion revolver or two. Well, I better wrap up before I talk. Start talking about things that are even more meaningless. All right. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you all watching, and we appreciate the support, uh, the loyalty, the the fact that you all demonstrate uh, such a high level of civility, really, on the channel and on the comments. We just don't get that many of those bizarre comments that, of course, pervade the YouTube world and the Internet world. Uh, we get a few. Appreciate you all voting them down and helping us manage those and setting people straight, uh, because I can't get around everyone. To, to do that so 
keep in mind there are uh, youngsters, lots of youngsters watching, and I'm not just referring to the fact that I teach, and there are youngsters there whose parents and their brothers and their little brothers and sisters probably, you know, so there are a lot of young people watching us uh, and watching everybody, not just me and us, but uh, I think it's our responsibility to help keep it civil uh, and the language as uh, you know reasonable as we can. Uh, and it's a chance for all of us to to be educators, you know. Uh, you all, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, I try to do that in general. But uh, one way you guys can help us is possibly, and I'm sure some of you do that. Someone comes on. Obviously, they're ten years old, or they're thirteen, and they're sitting in front of a computer, and they're just making stupid comments, or they're trying to cause trouble. I don't know if it help or not. It, it maybe we should uh, message them. I have done that before. But maybe we should uh, message them more often and just let them know, uh, without berating them, let them know they're just not representing, uh, you know, themselves very well. Or uh, I don't know. It's hard to know what would uh, actually change behavior, isn't it? Like, <laughs> what would your grandmother think if she read what you just typed? You know, or what would your father think? What would your favorite teacher think? What would uh, you know your favorite uncle? think if he saw what you just wrote i don't know how you make them uh think a little bit about what they're doing you know it, it would be good if we were able to maybe help i don't know mature some folks up but occasionally i guess we feel like we we're accomplishing something <laughs> of course there's always another forty thousand uh, to take their place but but i guess it's just too much fun or it's too tempting to be a troll for for some people that uh, don't have anything going for themselves you know or or who knows whatever they're envious or jealous or or whatever it might be uh most of the negative stuff i would i guess nowadays is probably uh from someone i've blocked like that that uh they come back and you know and and rate a video down or make a obscene comment you know because i mean there's just no way to avoid blocking some people i mean they're obviously coming in for, to cause trouble and i figure all of them don't come back probably but some do uh probably never go away but uh you know that gives them something to do in their life i guess but anyway we've got plenty to do in our lives and uh we're trying to be constructive and and have fun at the same time as 99.9 percent of you all are doing so appreciate your help in any of that appreciate your support uh we we still are in awe in a lot of ways uh, how 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 the thing has grown you know i still just uh, amazed that that it's uh gotten as popular as it has because i'm nothing special i just uh have a place to shoot some neat targets and been shooting a long time and enjoy doing it and uh, we throw a camera out there john's a pretty good cameraman and he's a creative guy too and you know it's just uh you know we don't see it as being uh us being anything all that special uh so we especially appreciate uh, the support and uh how much uh it's it's grown so it's it's been a surprise and it continues to surprise us so we just keep doing it as uh, long as we can because it's uh it's fun to shoot as you all know so anyway i'll shut up and uh i'll talk to you later like i said if i run into you at friendship or at uh, louisville gun day uh, say hi and uh we'll talk to you later you've been listening to the hickok 45 radio show see you on the range